that, and that right there showed us two different worlds. It really did. But I want you to understand something. Here at Thero, we, we empower teachers to reach the students where they are. Because students come with various um, learning disabilities, various needs. It's the charge of all of, our all of our teachers to reach the students where they are every day in every class. Understand that Atlanta Public Schools um, gets a lot of government money. We funnel it down, it's allotted to the schools where we're using that money to enhance the level of instruction being provided. Here at Thero, one, one thing that we do in the uh, STEM school is integrate technology into the classroom. I think that's a big thing that's missing with our, when we talk about a closing achievement gap, we gotta find alternative measures to reach our students, to keep them engaged. So as you go through, uh, visitors come in our building and they transition from one class to the other. One thing that separates us from any other high school is in every classroom, we incorporate technology to enhance the level of instruction being provided on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, last thing I wanna say about um, my school, although we use data to track our students to in, um, their academic performance in various subject areas, our students are more than just a number. We have academic advisory, just like I saw some scenes in this documentary where the students were meeting with teachers and parents, where they're addressing the uh, areas of concern immediately so that we can target those areas and keep our students on track for graduation. I'm not gonna stand here and keep going on and on. I wanted, what I wanna do next is introduce our speaker for this evening. Our speaker for this evening is Daniel's, uh, Dan Sims. Dan Sims is a proud native of Atlanta. He serves as the principal of Tri-Cities High School in East Point, Georgia. He graduated uh, from in 1989. Prior to this time, he was principal of Paul D. West Middle School, a school he also attended. Over his 19-year career, Mr. Sims has served in the East Point community as a math teacher, community and school coach, and assistant principal. He received his bachelor's degree in mathematics and his uh, master's degree in educational leadership from Georgia State University. Currently, Mr. Sims is in his final year of the doctoral program in educational leadership at Georgia State University. He is also a candidate for national board certification for principals. Mr. Sims has received numerous awards, most recently the Terrell Slayton Community Service Award for, uh, from the Red Cross and Principal of the Year for Fulton County Schools during the 2012-2013 school year. His greatest reward, however, is that of being a 15-year cancer survivor. In his spare time, he enjoys golf, working out, service at church, sleep, that's a big word, sleep, and spending time with his family. He is married to Tracy Sims, who serves as an early literary, literacy specialist for Atlanta Public Schools. And they have three children, Jordan, who's 11, Lauren, who's in heaven, and Camille, who's eight. I present to you Mr. Dan A. Sims. All right. Thank you, Mr. Andrews, very much. And uh, good evening, everybody. Everybody stand up for a minute so that uh, sleep won't be your enjoyment. Stretch it out a minute. We've been sitting for about a couple of hours. Get yourself a big stretch. I only need about three hours and then we'll be uh, on our way home. I'm just kidding. I bring you greetings from uh, Fulton County Schools and from Tri-Cities High School. And um, I know you have a lot on your mind as it relates to the documentary. Uh, but I come to you this afternoon, this evening, uh, as a principal, as a teacher, as a black man, as a father of a young black male child. And, just really has me thinking. Let me do a quick check to see who's in the audience. How many teachers do I have in the audience? All right. How many administrators do I have in the audience? Okay, central office, support personnel, teenagers. How many people have any interaction with a black male at any given time? That's everybody, amen. So we're all in the same boat and trying to figure out how we can do a better job at saving our sons. And what I wanna do this uh, evening is provide for you and right along the lines with the uh, documentary we just watched are uh, some of the things I found in my research over my doctoral program, which ironically is focused on African-American males as well. Uh, just so you will know, uh, this is my research question. It's a little bit more focused than what the documentary showed, but uh, there are some key pieces in here I wanted you to see. And that is the whole concept of teacher perceptions and practices 
and how that impacts the quality of what we do for African American males. Along that same line, uh, there are three critical areas I'm concerned with, transition to high school, uh, the effects of grade retention, and then of course the big one for me, African American males. And what I want to try to do during this time frame is uh, share some insights that I've found and I'll tell you right at the onset, I don't have strategies this evening. What I do ha have, however, is an approach for us to consider and just some opportunities for us to think a little bit more about what we can do better so that we can save our sons. Now, there are three challenges I want to start with uh, as we embark, and seriously, I only need about 20 minutes, so for those who thought I was three hours, uh, you can let that go. Three critical pieces I want to focus on. One is that of uh, academic engagement. I think we saw some of that issue in the documentary. Uh, second one is personal development, and uh, that gets right to the core of just that black male child becoming that black male adult. And then lastly, social adjustment and social success. And we saw some evidences of that as well in the documentary that we viewed. Here's some probing questions I want you to be thinking about as we embark upon this short journey. Number one, how do we better engage our African-American males in academics? We saw that as well in the documentary. Uh, probably the, the biggest question I want us to ask is, what do we know? I think we do a good job sometimes of thinking that we know what we know, but we don't know everything that we ought to know. And the truth is, the more that I read, the more I realize I don't know what I'm doing. It has been a very enriching process and, pro and, and, uh, and, and journey for me to learn more. And it's, it's, it's just driving me to want to mo know more and more because I have so many young boys counting on me every single day. The third question, how do we assist our African-American males in responding favorably in the settings that I have on this question? We saw some evidences of that as well in the video. And then one of the biggest questions is, where do we start? What I do hope to do is to give you something to do immediately as it relates to your challenge of trying to address the needs of our precious sons. Now, can we agree on something though? Can we agree that what we're talking about is important? Agreed? Can we agree that we can do it? Agreed? Oh Lord, I know, I know it's late y'all. Can we agree? Yes? Okay, and can we agree that we will not quit? Now, I don't know about y'all, but I think everybody has to have an alter ego, Mr. Andrews. Mine is a Superman. I'm sorry. It is what it is. I'm, I'm, I'm a little obsessive. Got a Superman wallet, about three or four Superman cufflinks. But it is my way to always remind myself that I'm in a serious position of authority, and I utilize that position to try to change the world. That's all what it's about. So I think all of us have to have some kind of alter ego, something that pushes you beyond your limits for what we're in the business of doing. And we're in the business of educating children. And for this evening, intents and purposes, finding a way to better serve our African-American males. So let's get right to it in the interest of time. I want to talk first about some challenges. And um, what I'm not going to do is impress you with all my uh, uh, knowledge of the different studies and how I can cite all those different things. My citations are at the bottom. I have the references at the end so that you can do some of your own studying. I want to get right to it. Cultural mistrust is, is a big piece uh, that came out in some of my research. And, and, and that is that over time, and again, you saw some of that in the documentary, that, that mistrust over time is something that happens to our African-American young men. And a lot of that has to do with how they interact with us folks. And it's something we're going to talk about towards the end. Day-to-day -day realities before the bell rings. I want you to think about how many times you've had a young man come into your school or come into your surrounding or into your classroom, and it was something else that they were dealing with that got in the way of what you wanted to deal with inside your classroom and how that became a barrier. And a lot of these things, y'all, are rooted as far back as slavery. And if you recall, when we first got here, we were not welcome. And so you have some of this still unwelcomed um, environment that our young black men engage in on a daily basis. Some from us, some not from us, but it is a reality. And then there's the issue of social ecological factors. And I'm, I'm speaking specifically about family related factors. And when I say socio ecological, what I'm talking about is how personal issues intertwine with environmental issues. And when those two come together, a continued challenge that our young men face. Now, the reason I'm giving you these challenges is because one of the things I want to propose this evening is that we must develop a deeper understanding of what our young men are going through. And if we do not, we will continue to hit 
roadblocks in trying to reach them and teach them and inspire them and get them to realize how amazing they are. So I have my findings broken down into about two or three categories. The first one is achievement disparities. Of course, there's the onslaught of negative stereotypes that continues throughout society as far as our African-American males are concerned. Uh, the acting white thought processes, you saw some of that in the documentary. That is something that continues on and what it has done is, is, is kind of produced this, these two separate worlds where our, our, our young men, as Idris was trying to do, was trying to fit in on one side and then try to fit in on the other side. And in his adolescent mind or growing adolescent mind, it really caused problems for him. And I'll talk a little bit about, in just a minute, what happens over time with some of those same social issues as they crop up. Discrimination, of course. You saw that very clearly. And one thing we saw in this, in this video was um, racial discrimination. But I would submit, and the research shows, that there's really not a race line, per se, when it comes to discrimination towards African-American males. Some that look just like them, smell just like them, have hairstyles just like them, discriminate as well. Of course, there are disproportionately negative portrayals in the media. You see that every single day. And all of this is having an impact on our, on our males. And then there's this issue of domesticated learners versus giving our African-American males an opportunity to become critical thinkers. thinkers. And when I say domesticated learning, what I'm talking about is a curriculum that's already set that does not take into account the needs, the interests, the background. It is taught and kids are expected to do just what it says to do. And when we engage in those kind of practices, those pose challenges for our sons over time. As far as environment is concerned, these are some of the, uh, the, the key things that I found. The first one had to do with exposure to violence and how it has a negative influence on outcomes for African-American males. In particular, it is the fact that when, when, when they get around violent surroundings, and of course this is not all of our African-American males, but I hope we're honest enough to agree that we have a violence problem in the African-American community. Are we honest enough to agree on that? And with that said, it is having a negative impact on the pocket of students who find themselves in those surroundings to the extent that when they try to come to school and focus on school, it is this concern of safety, not necessarily in the school, but the school combined with the community that makes it very difficult to focus. But what I want to impart on this particular side is, is this concept of concentration effects theory and social disorganization theory. And essentially what concentration effects theory says is if you have this dynamic in place, and let's use the documentary again as an example. If you have a dynamic of two parents who keep pushing this same school on you despite the fact that there are issues going on, then it over time will have a negative impact on your well-being. And we saw some evidence of that. Another example that was in this particular study uh, that I read had to do with the fact that if you have a poor African-American, only female-led household over a long period of time, it was shown that this would lead to some serious issues that would be difficult to turn around for the kid. The second piece had to do with social disorganization theory. And essentially what this said is that if you have different social issues that you deal with over a long period of time, it will result in social interactions or, or, or challenges that you will have in trying to get along with other people. So you take a, the same kid who's in a violent surrounding or, or, or a kid who is, is, is having this issue because they're going to, kids, going to school with kids who ostracize him, in, in the case of Idris in some, in some examples. Over a period of time, it will have a negative effect. And that is something that is found to have a, a profound influence on the impact on the self-esteem of our African-American males. And this is the one I really want to talk about because I was so moved by what research said about adults and the impact they have, regardless of race, regardless of class, on African-American male students. Of course, one of the obvious ones was that overall family success would lead to African-American male success. But in the, in the documentary, we saw some issues with that, did we not? We saw some issues with that, but overall that family success breeds African-American male success. But here's the one I want you to capture, and I think the majority of people in here are teachers. Please hear this loudly. Teacher perceptions influence African-American male engagement and African-American male achievement. Just how you perceive that African-American male when he walks into your classroom, when he engages in instruction with you, 
over time. It has a significant impact on the extent to which he will be engaged and how he will achieve. And here's a quote I took right from this particular piece of research. The school facilitates the underachievement of African-American male students by not understanding the effects of teacher practices. So all teachers, I want you to pause for the cause in just, for just a moment. I want you to think about some of your most stellar teacher practices that you engage in in your classroom. But my second thing I want you to do is answer this question. To what extent have you considered the unique needs of African-American male students as it relates to your teacher practices? And this particular piece of research found that there was a disconnect between practices that teachers decided to engage in and whether or not they were meeting these unique needs. I'm thinking about my own son right now because as I saw Idris, I saw some of my son. I saw hyperactivity in the midst of making A's and I saw this brilliant kid but not always um, uh, operating with the right kind of impulses. And then all of a sudden he gets put on medication and I think there were some of the quotations that the things that were said in the video that kind of said that the kid was the problem. So is it that the kid is the problem or is it our lack of understanding of the kid? And I would submit that it's more so the extent to which we don't understand the needs of African-American male students. So again, I don't have strategies for you this, this afternoon. And honestly, I, I did have about three hours worth of stuff I could share with you, but I had to break it down to 20 minutes. So I wanted to give you those big items as far as challenges and findings were concerned. So I don't have strategies, but what I do have are some things that I want us to consider as far as approaches are concerned. And here is the list. And what I want to do right now is go through each one of these, or most of these, and give you some insights as it relates to some things that perhaps we can consider first thinking about and then doing. One big mistake I think we make, my people, is that we are so quick to get out and do. And we don't take enough time to really think it through, to get some other minds around, to, to, to vet our ideas and, and vet our frustrations and be honest about our perceptions so that the impact that we have in the end will be optimal. Let's start with this one. One thing that research shows is that we have to connect aspirations with direction. I want y'all to do me a favor, and a lot of y'all are going to disagree with me before I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway because I have the microphone. I want you to stop shooting down kids who say they want to play for the NFL. Dan, why are you saying that? Let's think about it from this perspective. Connecting aspirations with directions. What does it require to go to the NFL? College. And if it requires college to go to the NFL, what does it require to go to college to some of the teams that kids want to go to? It requires some serious academics and a good SAT score. So I personally think we have missed the opportunity. And when our kids say they want to do certain things and we want to shoot it down, and I kind of heard um, 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 Shion's mom shoot down that whole graphic arts idea. But what we have to learn how to do is take a child's pure aspiration and then lace that with direction. And what the research showed is that African-American males, just like white males, Asian kids, all kids, they have no problem communicating to you what they want to do. But the disconnect comes when we fail to offer them authentic ways to connect their aspirations with exactly what they need to do and then layer that with the right types of supports. And research shows that when that happens, then we no longer have pipe dreams. I'll be very honest. I've been one of those people who have shot down people's kids' dreams as opposed to saying, wait a minute, that's what you want to do? Well, let's talk about it. Let's line it up. You have to do this, 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 and this. Here's where you are. Here's how far you are away. Here's what time you have to commit to it. But giving them some authentic direction. A very simple concept, but something we fail to do, but something that we can easily do because we've been there ourselves. The second thing we need to consider is creating a sense of mattering. I was thinking about this one over and over and over as I watched this documentary. And all this simply says is that African-American males must be in an environment where they feel like they matter. Throwing a question out again to the teachers, and you'll see why I keep saying teachers in just a minute. How do you know that kids feel like they matter in your classroom? What evidence could you give if you were to ask every single African-American male in your class, starting with them, since we're talking about African-American males, what evidence would they give you that they matter to you? 
And then if we were to extend that outside the classroom, do, do, do African-American males feel like they matter in the school setting? Do they matter to the principal? Do they matter to the assistant principal? Do they matter to the custodians, the cafeteria workers, everybody? Do they matter? And it is found that when they feel like they matter, then it makes all the difference in their level of engagement and they benefit from it. Matter, a matter, as a matter of fact, the relationship between student and teacher is arguably one of the most critical relationships that will go on in any school setting. So I want you to just start tomorrow, if you will. Once you engage with some African-American males, I want you to just ask yourself as they walk by, does he know that he matters to me? Does he know that he matters to me? Does he know that he matters to me? I want you to ask yourself that question and be honest with yourself. This is a big one as well. This whole concept of meeting physical, emotional, and psychological needs. But when I talk about these particular items, I'm talking about a real focused approach as it relates to meeting educational challenges. And what I mean is, if we talk about mentor mentoring, it needs to be focused. Not just this dude or this person to be in the, be in the life of an African American male, but what is the focus of the mentorship? We have done a great job at Tri-Cities High School of providing mentors with no focus. We've gotten better. And one of the things we have to do better is ensure that there is a focus. Promoting racial identity. Did you see how things kind of changed for Xi'an as he started to increase his level of racial identity? That is something that is so critical and it is so missed in our schools and it's something that we have to all focus on. And then, Make sure that whatever we do, it is culturally responsive. And what I'm really getting at in this light is, is, is the issue of pedagogy. Um, but not just pedagogy, but there, that there is a culturally responsive environment that takes into consideration the needs and the interest of our sons. And again, as I talk about focus, at the end of the day, our focus should be on academic identity and academic performance because what will bubble up from that is a sense of belonging, a higher level of self-esteem, and really feeling that they can go and do something great. Now, there was a, um, a set of surveys and a census that was done over the years that you see. And the findings from those surveys outlined these three things that were, uh, that were, that were critical. The importance of a nuclear family. Now, I know that that is something that we, it, that is not an overall reality for everyone. But it did say that if there's a nuclear family in place, and what I want to say to that is, if there is a presence of a father, a presence of a mother, and a, a significant engagement from both of those, we set our kids up for success. I'll tell you what I told my wife. I told my wife, and we never will, but I said, baby, if you ever leave me, I'm buying the house across the street. Because I promise you, I will not leave my kids because I understand my responsibility. But she's not going to leave me. She loves me so much, it's ridiculous. And then there's the issue of counseling. I don't know about y'all, but uh, counseling is one of those things that gets marred with paperwork and, and all other kind of issues. But the missed opportunity is that chance to engage African-American males in some serious, sit-down, intimate, real conversation over time. And then, of course, the last one, the importance of cognitive, behavioral, and affective systems being in place for African-American males. So essentially what I'm getting to on this particular slide is the importance of a comprehensive approach to raising our sons. And again, with the understanding that there are some unique factors that our African-American males possess that must be met. Here's the meat of it, though. The focus, in my opinion, and based on the readings that I've done and I continue to do, has to be on the classroom. There has to be an increased understanding of the African-American male. If we were to take a test right now about the African-American male, I wonder how well we would do as it relates to our understandings of his cognitive development, his, 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 his social well-being, what goes on in his life, how he deals with environmental factors. I wonder how well we would do. And I throw that out because I want to urge everyone to challenge wherever you are regarding your so-called understanding, and I'm including myself in this, because although I am an African-American male and I was a teenager and I was a boy, I'm still learning because I was not an African-American adolescent male in 2014. So guess what? I still have some stuff that I have to continue to learn. The big one for me, and I put it in bold, the increased quality of relationships. If I had to subtitle the documentary based on Idris, you know what I would have called it? 
at least he had a dog. Did anybody catch? That, 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 was, that was the long-standing relationship that he sustained. And he even said that the dog consoled him. And what was revealed in, in, in this conversation that Idris was having with himself is the fact that he needed that consoling. He needed somebody just to listen. Did you hear him talk about the dog, how the dog listens? Sometimes our African-American males just need to be heard. Idris' mom had difficulties doing that because Idris would talk and then they would automatically have something to say back. And I want to say to everybody here, let's make sure that if we build those relationships, it is a relationship where two-way com communication can happen and it can fervently happen. Culturally relevant pedagogy, a very critical piece. I want you to think about your last lesson, teachers, and I want to ask you what in that lesson was culturally relevant? And I would submit that we have the capacity to do something culturally relevant at any given time in any given lesson. And you're setting yourselves up when you do that to gain more and more kids and more pieces of kids as time passes by. And then the, the, the finding, one finding also said uh, as it relates to an approach, when two conditions are in place, when the teacher provides real world examples associated with learning, and when the teacher takes time to explain material step by step in some cases and offers that guidance, you gain that African American male. It's not something you have to do all the time, but it has to be a foundation of what you do, and you have to be keen enough to be able to see the need to go step by step if you have to, back up when you can, in order for that African-American male to fly. Continuing with that, there was also some research that talked about um, the effect of teachers in urban school settings. And what it laid out were these particular pieces that not only the effective teacher does in the urban school setting for African-American males, but because they do these, it urges the kid to do them as well. They envision life beyond the present situation. So I want to ask you, when you see an African-American male, do you see him as he is or do you see him as he could be? And everything that you can see uh, based on talents that he's distributed that, that you see he could become. They come to know themselves in relation to others, a very critical concept. They speak possibility and not destruction. How much destruction did we hear in the documentary? How much destruction do our African-American males hear on a daily basis? They care and they demonstrate care. And then lastly, they change their thinking to change their actions. And that is my biggest charge this evening is that all of us take a look at how we think about our sons and how we can utilize that thinking and challenge that thinking to think differently so that we can get a better result. But also at the same time, never ever let go of our expectations. Because teacher expectations, based on the research, is one of the most significant predictors of the success of an African American male. The more that you expect, but it must be laced with the care and the concern and the commitment and all those critical pieces. When you expect high things and they know that you care and they can smell that you care and they can feel that you care, then great things happen. So my premise is based on the adult and not so much the African-American male child because the African-American male child is gonna come as he is. And it is our challenge to understand that African-American male as best as we can. But we must look at our attitudes towards African-American males. We must look at our perceptions of our sons. We must look at our preparation as far as teaching them is concerned. And then we must survey our commitment. And I put right in the center, love. And my question to everybody, if I were to ask you, do you love the African-American males that you interact with? I already know that most of all of us would say, you know what, Mr. Sims, I love all my kids. I know you would say that. But it must be that love that serves as the foundation to lead to all these other pieces that will help you to be honest about your perceptions and honest about your attitudes. Now, at the end of the day, what I want to recommend everyone to do is to find an opportunity to gather with like-minded people. And I want to urge you to do this in your building if you have not done so. And let's find a gathering place where we all agree. And let's have that conversation about what it is that we can do better with ourselves as it relates to how we perceive our sons and understand our sons so that what we do for our sons will reach our sons. Otherwise, perhaps our efforts are in vain. So the big question is, where do we start? We start with us. And we start with deepening our understanding. We start with being honest with ourselves about our perceptions. And we ensure that everything that we do that's targeted towards our sons is based on the fact that we are trying to deeply understand them, 
deeply love them and deeply engage them and more than anything, make sure that they feel that they matter in the end. So I want to challenge everybody, once you leave tonight, to start somewhere. And it might just be, be that you start by reading some more information and to just channel your understanding of your sons. I want you to challenge to maybe pull somebody else to the side and let's have that conversation. Perhaps you can find out how we can have more people to view this documentary. Let's do something that will increase our understandings and increase our awareness of our own perceptions and our own knowledge so that we can move forward in a positive light. Now, again, at the end of this, uh, I'm not sure how we'll be able to share it, but I have several references that backs up everything that I've talked about, and I want to make sure that you have access to those particular pieces. But I first want to just thank everybody for responding to the call of what I consider to be a fantastic documentary and a great opportunity to gather this evening to talk about a very important topic. But please know this is nothing easy that we're talking about, but what we can do is start somewhere, and I hope that we all start with ourselves and build our understandings and challenge ourselves. I want to open up the floor at this particular time. If anybody has any questions, any commentary that you want to offer, we want to open up the floor at this time for that. And the microphone is right here. Okay, got a question. Could you come to the, to the mic for the uh, benefit of the... I, I think they need, you to, they, they need you to come to the mic. Yes. teacher at Bunch Middle School, which is the feeder school for Thero, and I also am in a PhD program, and my research area involves the rituals involved in the classroom that either hinder or push African-American male success. And one of the things that stood out in the documentary to me was that first, um, those things that need to be in place for African-American males to be successful, and that is helping them to feel better about themselves even when they can't do it on their own. And that was, one of the, that was one thing. And I can't even remember what the other one is, but I want to say thank you to whoever organized this viewing. But I did want to say something about Mr. Andrews because he used to be the assistant principal at Bunch. And I listened to him up here and he kind of played down his involvement with the um, young men in this community, in my opinion, because um, one of the, re he, He's one of the reasons why I became interested in how to make those changes in my classroom because um, often when the young males would do certain things, we get frustrated, especially as an Afri African American woman. And I would run, chase him down and say, you have to do something with this boy. And 10 minutes later, I would see Mr. Andrews and the young men in a different capacity. The boy's calm, the boy's doing what he's told, he's cooperating, he's agreeable, and so on and so forth, and I didn't understand it at first. And then I would watch Mr. Andrews teach, one, not figuratively, but literally teach 100 students at one time in a theater setting like this, and I couldn't understand how those African-American males would sit in for an hour and pay attention and do math problems. So basically, as I started to do my research, I realized that the one thing that Mr. Andrews was doing differently at that time that I wasn't doing was making sure that I let these African-American males know that, like you're saying, that they matter. And I just wanted to point that out because I felt that was very important. Very good. That's, that's a critical piece, making sure that they feel that they matter. And they can smell his love, his concern, and I feel they can smell yours as well a mile away, and it makes all the difference. Praise God for what you do. Hi, good evening. My name is Tanya Buford, and um, the documentary struck several chords with me. One, I am a single mother of three teenage sons, a 19-year-old college freshman, a 17-year-old high school senior, and a 16-year-old high school sophomore um, who just turned 16 on Monday. Many things I saw made me feel proud as a mother, good things that supported what I've read and the research I've done on my own and just the life experience. And there were things that made me feel not so proud that I've been guilty um, of doing as I sat and watched with two of my sons that are here tonight. And one thing I wanna say to parents, um, and I said this to my son in the middle and he is the middle child and I am putting you on blast. It's been a long, arduous journey but at the end, on May 24th, it would have well been worth it. And I gave him a fist pound and I said thank you three high schools later for never giving up. They counted you out, but I didn't. And you didn't count yourself out, most importantly. 
As parents, we get tired, we fall down, we get frustrated. I saw several times in there where the parents quit on their kids and we are not allowed to do that ever. And we have to support them and you have to keep on scratching because it can be done until you find someone in that school, someone in your church, and someone in your community. I work with parent engagement every day. We're fighting and scratching for you all. We need you to fight and scratch for yourselves and to come up, meet the teachers in a minute. You have administrators like this and they are plentiful. Everybody in the school system is, you know, nobody's against the kid. And I think we all have to come to the table together and realize that together we can make it. There were many great teachers and principals that helped me along the way. And I just want to say thank you for sharing your work. Thank you to Mr. Gillette for bringing this to Theral. And I am going to be definitely trying to show it at Young Middle School. And thanks to everybody who sat through this because we're all tired. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations on the journey. I, I'm, I'm so glad she said journey because it's one thing I got from Idris at the end. He got the Occidental. And he, was, he was on that beach and he, he made reference to the journey. And if we stay with that journey, amazing things can happen despite it all. I want to say kudos as well to whoever put this on. It's great. Um, what a wonderful opportunity to have my son with me uh, and to hear it and to experience it and to ask him some questions. He agreed with most of what you were saying, which was good. Uh, not all of it, but most of it. Uh, there was a category when you asked who was present that you missed, yet you made it a part of the most important strategy. One was parents. Parents, you yes. You missed that part. How many parents were here? And of course, and most parents, most of the teachers are parents. It, it, so I'm, that's just a category, I think. Thank you. Also, I wanted to say small group dynamic experiences for the males. Uh, there's something uh, that the juvenile courts are doing here in Fulton County that I've been a part of that's really been interesting. But I've been a part of it after they get in trouble, not before they get in trouble. These are kids primarily who have felonies, and they've been you know, at least expelled from the schools, et cetera, et cetera. I'm wondering if there's any way you can integrate this educational model into the, ch the kid's life prior to them getting to that level. I think there was so much information that the movie shared that a lot of the kids could identify with, a lot of the young males in particular can identify with, that they're experiencing and going through. And I, you know, as I looked out into the audience, there's a noticeable absence of the very market, I mean, a target that you're trying to reach in addition to teachers and you know, administrators and so forth. So I'm, my question is, how can you integrate this into uh, more of a grassroots community level beyond the educators uh, and parents and the young people who are impacted primarily. Okay, all right, I, th I think I, I captured your question. The, the biggest thing that we have to do is develop, and I thought we would have done it by now, is, is a huge sense of urgency. I don't, I don't know what it's gonna take, y'all, and, and it really kind of blows my mind. Sir, I, I remember last year, uh, I think it was last year, after the uh, Trayvon Martin case, we had this huge rally at my school and all of these interest groups came out and we were saying we're going to take back our black males and we're going to protect them. And I opened up my school and I said, for anything that you want to have at any time under any circumstances, this is your place. Ask me how many meetings we had after that. Zero. Zero. So, so I think the challenge we're facing, sir, is that we become very special interests at certain times, but what's going on every single day is the life or the death of our African-American males. So I think the first step is just, just to see how many people are willing to, back to the commitment piece I talk about with adults, who's committed? And then we have to find a way to start with that group and become that think tank. It's really what I was referring to in challenging everybody to go back to your school, grab somebody and just become a think tank and you ask yourselves, what can we do differently right here? Now, I don't have the answer how all of those pieces can come together and stay together, but at the end of the day, it is an issue of adult commitment, of being able to put in the time, to put in the sacrifice that we do for our own kids, that we do at church, we know how to do it, but it's something about this topic that won't keep us on the battlefield 
like we were in civil rights days. And we're, this, this is, a, this is a, an issue that is just as astronomical, in my opinion, as things were back in the day. And, and, and if we don't find a way to do that, I, I don't know exactly what to do. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I would, really want to address the challenge, and that is adult commitment. Because it's easy to put together a plan, but we've got to commit to it. Hello. I'm at Coretta Scott with your single gender school. About two years ago, they had a uh, seminar at the Gurian Institute, in which they did single gender training. But that single gender training had nothing to do with African American boys. So what are we doing in Atlanta Public School to educate the teachers? Not holding rallies and things like that to actually educate teachers. Okay, first of all, I'm, I'm from Fulton County Schools. But, but what I can say is that, that this, this was a part of a grant. America's Promise, is that the grant? But this was a part of a grant and, and one of those stepping stones to begin the conversation that we're having tonight. And, and, and I love the fact that, you know, Dan and I are great friends. Uh, we used to work together. And I love the fact that he's reached over into another district to, to engage. So maybe what could happen is that districts can come together and start talking about the same issue. So, so I, I wish I could answer that question, but I want to applaud Atlanta Public Schools for starting with this particular process, which I think is a great, great step. And I, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to um, ask that question a little more deeply. Because I personally think that from teachers, from, from the instructors, if those kind of questions come out, then perhaps we can get a little more traction and not let this just be this isolated event that we have. I'm so short. Um, my question is, now that I know I've messed up, and I, I knew that probably this year, because work, I've worked with the same group of African-American males from fourth grade until now most of them are juniors at a Saturday school environment. And I realized I messed up because they run and don't want to come in my class. So obviously I haven't built that relationship for them to want to come into my classroom. So now that I understand, and I know what it is, I taught special education for so many years. Um, usually my opportunities with black males was because they were EBD, put out of other places, nobody wanted to deal with them. And I think I have, my mindset has become unfortunately clouded with the opinion that maybe they're not, maybe they do have, maybe it is this problem. Just like I saw with those students and I'm thinking, he doesn't look ADHD to me. He doesn't mm -hmm. look like he has <laughs> dyslexia to me, but here's a child who's asking for medication because he feels so out of place. So now that I know that I've done some of those things that I saw those parents doing, but out of a good heart, because I just wanted them to be the best. And I was thinking that my way was the right way, but I'm now noticing that perhaps there's a different way. How do I go back and forge with, with, I've really started doing this. I really give away money now. I do. If they come in and sit in the front of the class and answer questions, I start giving out money. Um, because I just want them to understand that there's a relationship to you do what people want from you. It contributes to you being financially successful. But I don't want that to be the only reason that they come to my room. Mm -hmm. I'm admitting to making the mistakes. So now what do I need to do or what can I do to get that relationship between the student and teacher back? Okay, great question. I want to correct you first. You didn't mess up. You did, you did the best that you knew how to do. And, and you, need, you need to be thankful for that. Um, I would say that you go back the same way you would go back and put rubber back on your tires from the asphalt. Can't do that. Okay, that rubber's on the road and you have the traction that you have right now. So what I would say with your, your increased understanding of the importance of that relationship, I, I will first challenge you to ask yourself, do I know how to build relationships with people? And I believe your answer would be yes. And I would challenge you to take that same capacity and just lace that with deepening your understanding of your African-American male students. That'll be through listening, through reading, through asking other people, through getting insights, and then just work from there and build a relationship. And don't be in a rush, but just build the relationship. My, my wife and I are together forever. And I'm building that relationship even now, 17 and a half years later. But the commitment is to build the relationship and to better understand her and make sure she better understands me. And that's what makes our marriage work. And I think it would be the same thing that makes that teacher-student relationship work as well. Yes. How, how, many, uh, how many questions do we have time for? Okay. Okay. One more? Okay. Great. I don't, I don't
don't think that um, Idris' parents did him totally wrong putting him in that environment. I um, I, I went to um, my college experience plenty of times I was the only black person in the classroom. And um, I tell my students, all of them happen to be African American, that this right here, what you're surrounded by, when you get out in the real world, this is not going to be your situation. And you have to learn how to survive in other arenas. You need to learn the skills and, and have the skill set in order to be able to, to work in environments that are not African, totally African American and survive in environments that are not totally African American. Now, for um, Sion, he felt better once he got into the school that was majority African American. But that's not necessarily going to be his reality when he goes to school. And he has to learn how to function in those environments. Um, like my daughter, she went to summer camp for, for engineering. She was the only African American female in the class and the youngest. So she had to learn how to, she has to know how to survive out there. And I tell my black males that, you, that you, you, this is not reality. It's just how the system's students have been shifted around um, when you get out there in the workplace. So I think it's important to also to point that out, that when we talk about cultural awareness and we need to provide the students cultural um, security and then move them with cultural awareness, that that's not necessarily always gonna be their reality once they leave the school building. And we need to prepare them for the world that's out there. Because they're not competing with students from APS. They're competing with students from around the world. That's the very, very important to make sure that we teach them that. And I think the beauty of what you're saying, I can hear you as a parent, not only uh, engaging in such environments, but ensuring that as a parent, you are paying attention and that you are educating your child along the process. And I think one thing that Idris's parents could have done a little bit better is pay more attention to impact and be able be ready and able to engage so that the son's esteem stays where it needs to be so that he's even more empowered. But you're bringing up an excellent point. This, this is a global society and there's a lot that we have to get our kids ready for. I believe that's our final question. I wanna say thank you to Dan Gillette. Thank you for this project and I think this is an amazing piece. I was really encouraged as a parent and as a principal uh, by the documentary and I hope you were as well. And I hope I've given you something this afternoon that you can walk away with, uh, that you can use immediately as we strive to do a better job by our sons. Thank you and God bless you.